seated. Welcome to church. We're glad you're here. You all look nice today. You know that? They do look pretty, don't they? 
I feel sorry for the other churches. I didn't know Steve was this tall. Well, good morning. Do we have any first-time visitors with us today? First time you've ever attended our church service? Anybody else? We got them all with the visitor packet. Okay, now let's make them feel welcome. All together. Sounds so much better. Amen. The only announcement that I have is uh, next Sunday, actually two announcements, but next Sunday we will be having a water baptism service. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet on the back table if you would like to be baptized in water. And if you've never been baptized in water, you need to. Jesus said, do it. So that's why we do it. And uh, we would be more than happy to have you take part in that. Uh, water baptism next Sunday. Also, uh, August, most of you have heard the uh, Glenn Graves, if you don't know him by that name, Googie, passed away a few days ago, and uh, we will be having a service, tell me Arlen, August 14th here at the church, tentatively, it may change, but right now that's what they have in mind, the family has in mind is August 14th, at 10 a.m. visitation, and the service would begin at 11. So if there's any change, hopefully we can let you know uh, so you can prepare accordingly, okay? Uh, that's all the announcements I got. I think Sister Pat had something that she wanted to share this morning. Good morning, everyone. Next Saturday, the 7th at 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm having a work day here. And I have eight people that signed up, most of them men, and I thank you for that because we never have that happen. But um, we want to start early before it gets so hot, and uh, it won't take us long if we have a lot of people. And we, <laughs> I'll be here at four. The rest of them can come at eight. <laughs> Everybody says I'm here before anybody else. And also, uh, tentatively tomorrow, uh, Sandy Beasley is moving, and she wants a group to come and help her pack up. I tried to call her this morning and uh, didn't get an answer. She didn't call back? Okay. And uh, so uh, she's going to, I think she's moving on the 14th, so we need to help her do that. So if, if you want to help do that, just see me after church or whatever, and we'll get over there and try to get her packed up. And uh, for you who don't know that Frank and Marge that sit right here, Frank had a bad fall last night. Uh, he's uh, hurt his head really bad. And she called me at 9.30 last night, and... Um, they was taking him to the emergency room, and she wasn't allowed to go because of COVID, and she was very upset. So if you all keep them in your prayers, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I believe that's all the announcements we have. How many of you here remember where you was at when Jesus came into your life? We all were in sin. We could say that. Maybe not the location or anything. And we called out to Jesus and said, Lord, would you come to me? And he did that very thing. Amen. I know that I'm not worthy.
into sin. He'll come right where we're at. Amen. God bless you this morning. Give your attention to Pastor Arlen Beck. Break your neck, Beck. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Brother Ronnie. We like to do an oldie. It's been a while since we've done it, however. But, uh, I always like the message of this song. I guess I always will. Like the guy that wrote it, the name was Don Francisco. You may have heard of him. He wrote the song, He's Alive. We've done it a few times, too, maybe about 24 times. Every Easter, I guess it would be. But this, the title of this song is One Heart at a Time. And it's so true. If we could just reach out to one heart at a time and lead them to Jesus, this world could change. Amen. Brother Bill.
looking for a hero Everybody's waiting on a big noise Everybody's hoping for a hot shot Everybody's betting on the big boys They don't know, they don't see It all begins with you and me God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. One heart at a time. Sister April's on vacation this week, and uh, Brother Rick's going to come up and lead and praise and worship. So give your attention. This is going to be a special, so you don't have to stand unless you want to, of course. But if you stand now, you'll be standing a long time. You understand? <laughs> Here we go. Good morning. Good morning. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. We got to get excited as Christians. We got to start right here in our own church. We got to get excited because we're heirs to the throne. We, we, we have a place in God's kingdom. So if you believe it, you got to receive it. And if you feel it, you got to testify. That's what this song's about. If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles, you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lie. You're trying to feel the same old walls inside. There's a better life. There's a better life. You got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, 
He's a way maker. If you need freedom, saving, He's a prison shaking Savior. You got chains. He's a chain breaker. Yeah. We've all searched for the light, day and dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all wrong the things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. You got pain. He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom. Saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, he's a chain breaker. I like this part. You believe it, you receive it, you can feel it. Testify, testify. You believe it, you receive it. You can feel it, somebody testify, testify. Come on, one more time. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify. You got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, Saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, he's a chain. Let's sing that chorus one more time. Thank you, Jesus. You got pain, he's a pain taker. You feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You got chains. He's a chain breaker. If you need freedom, a saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You got chains. He's a chain breaker. If you got chains. He's a chain. One more time. If you got chains. He's a chain breaker. That song reminds me when he's telling the disciples to go and they're worried about what they're going to take with them. He's sufficient, church. He's absolutely sufficient. Let's continue in praise and worship him. Sing that part again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He has set the prisoner free. By his own great mercy, we are saved. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 The 
Lord reigns, we will sing and shout. You reign, you reign, you reign forever, King of all. The Lord reigns. The Lord reigns, let the people shout. He reigns in righteousness. Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice. The Lord reigns, let the people clap their hands. The angels shout, the redeemed have come to dance, to celebrate, to celebrate you reign. The Lord reigns, the Lord reigns, the Lord reigns. Sing and shout, you reign, you reign, you reign, forever King of all. This is our part, church. We gotta sing of it. Let all the people sing of your awesome power in all the earth let darkness tremble at your name why do the nations rage when our king is on his throne now and forever you will reign let's sing it again let all the people sing of your awesome power in all the earth. Let darkness tremble at your name. Why do the nations rage when our King is on His throne? receive it and he's talking about that forgiveness when you've asked him to forgive you for your sins and you feel it you got to tell somebody this song talks about forgiveness sing it with us I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died. Sing it to him again. I'm forgiven, because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is
amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love i know it's true it's my joy to honor you in all i do i want to go back and sing that verse again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose. Sing it to him, church, amazing love. Amazing love, how can it be? You, my king, would die, lowly, wretched old me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to want. Sing it to him again. Amazing love. Amazing love, how can it be? But you, my king, would thank you so much. We thank you for your blessing of the Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you for everything that you do here. Let it be received fully, Father God. Let someone walk out of here from this building today full on feeling your love and power in their life. I thank you for all these beautiful faces and all these beautiful souls. I ask that you continue to have your way here this morning. Continue to bless and anoint every part of this church and message and everything that happens here this morning. We thank you for everything that transpires. We thank you for all of our blessings. Thank you, Jesus. And all of this we ask in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Everyone say, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you.
I'm not, there we go. Amen. Today we're going to be looking at the book of Luke. Luke chapter 12. A very familiar passage of scripture to many. Let's begin reading in verse 16. And I did go up from 250 to 300 this week on my glasses, so now I can read. I just have to pull them down on my nose because if I look up, I'd be, everybody's be blurry. Huh? And that gives you a headache, so if you can see me with my glasses down, you'll know why. Amen, like bifocals. And he spoke a parable unto them, saying, A ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this story, we realize the folly of this man, though he may have attained much in this life, and obviously he did, but he lost so much in eternity. And Father, I pray that there's no one here today that would make that decision to invest everything into this life and forget about things that are eternal. Remind us once again how temporary this life truly is. And somehow by your Spirit, touch us with eternity today and help us realize the most important things in life, that we'll make right decisions, we'll make good decisions, we'll make godly decisions decisions here while we're on earth and we can lay up treasures up in heaven where moth and rust doth not corrupt and when we get there our rewards shall follow but the greatest reward that we're all looking forward to Jesus is seeing your face until then help us to occupy help us give us the strength the faith and the knowledge to operate in this world this evil present world that we're living in and we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'd like to title the message today, Me, Myself, and I. Did you notice there were three people here in our text? Did you notice that? Me, myself, and I. That's all this man could talk about was himself. Everything was about him. I like to call it the unholy trinity that man walks in. Me, myself, and I. There is unity in that unholy trinity, but it's all about oneself. It's all about me. And everything in life was all for him. That's all he could think about. It even seems like he was talking to himself, doesn't it? That's all he could think about was what he had, what he was going to have. I don't know if you noticed, but in those three short verses in the beginning, 13 times self comes up. Let's just look briefly through them real quick. Verse 17, he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room wherefore to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Do you see how selfish this man was? Everything was rooted in this world. My dad had a saying. It was kind of probably this man's mantra. Can all you can, or excuse me, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on the can. <laughs> I heard him say that many, many times when he's seen people that were so wrapped up in this world. And he would try to impress that upon me. It's not all about the things you possess, Arlen. Because people have a tendency to, to get all they can, to can all they get, and to sit on the can. And that's exactly what this man did and said, it's all mine. 
all mine. I heard of a story of a lawyer, and now all lawyers are not bad, so please don't misunderstand me. Just like all preachers aren't bad, all policemen aren't bad, all politicians aren't bad, okay? But this lawyer was, okay? <laughs> and he received a, a phone call from someone that was collecting contributions. He said, you know, our records show that you're a very wealthy man, but yet you've never contributed to our cause. Then he asked this man a question. Well, did your survey also say that my, show you that my dad left my mom and left her with nothing? Of course, the gentleman on the phone said, well, well, no, I didn't see that in the report. He says, well, did your report show that my brother is disabled and cannot work? Did your report show that? He said, well, well, well no, it didn't show that. He said, well, did it show that my sister had lost her job and just barely getting along? And very embarrassed, this man who had called him just felt terrible. He said, well, well no, that wasn't in my report. He said, well, if I don't give anything to them, what makes you think I'm going to give anything to you? <laughs> wow, what a selfish, selfish guy. But let's look at our context real quick. Why did Jesus tell them about this parable? And we find the answer to that in chapter 12, verse 13. He said, and one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to thy brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Make it right, Jesus. This is not fair what he's doing. You, you need to make things fair because everybody thinks Jesus is all about equality and equity and he brings peace to the situation. I didn't come to bring peace because I came to bring truth and there's going to be evil and there's going to be lies and they're going to clash. And there's going to be a contrast between good and evil because I have come to this world. If you think that I'm going to bring priests to every situation and equality and equity, you're wrong. But that's what they thought the Messiah would do. But just come and make everything hum. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but Jesus says, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And I think Jesus explains it best last week we read in John's gospel, if you remember. But I want to read it one more time in verse, chapter 18, verse 35, when Jesus comes before Pilate. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and chief priests had delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. We need to understand that. Jesus' kingdom is not of of this world. And that's why he told that man, I'm not your divider. I'm not the one you should come to and try to arbitrate these situations between you and your brother. He said, because this world is not my kingdom. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So we have to realize this is not Jesus' kingdom here on the earth. And this is at best temporary. Now, thank God he has blessed us while we're here. And we can even enjoy the fruits of our labor while we're here. But we have to be careful that our possessions don't possess us. Amen? How many times have you seen that happen? But back in Luke, he says this. Amen. Let me find my place. Take heed, verse 15, chapter 12. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Just the opposite of what the world thinks, isn't it? Possessions are not the measure of a man. Now, to the world it is. And I don't know about you, but I've been, I've been guilty of it myself. You know, even the Beatitudes, there are a paradox. Have you noticed it? Blessed are the poor. Well, we don't look at it like that, do we? You would never, blessed are, the, blessed are the poor. Yeah, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. How can the poor be blessed? Our way of thinking is blessed is the rich. We, walk, we drive by and see someone with a big, fancy house and everything. Boy, they're blessed. Look, at, look what they have. Look what their possessions are. But that's not how Jesus looks at the things, and that's not how we should look at things. And I've been guilty. I've been out on the bay, down the rivers, on a boat, and look over and see a beautiful home. Nice boat on the davit sitting there and think, man, those people have arrived. They are living the dream. But we have no idea what's going on inside of that house, do we? 
There have been people with plenty of wealth end up drinking themselves to death because they are so miserable. And that's not always the case. There are some wealthy people who know Jesus Christ. Their possessions don't possess them. They know how to keep from being covetous and worshiping mammon. And we need to know the difference also. And just a little footnote that I have to clear up because I get questions from time to time from people about things that have happened. And we were on a boat a few weeks ago in Homosassa. And uh, used to people would take pictures and put them in scrapbooks. Remember those days? And mostly family saw them. Well, now they take pictures and put them on Facebook. You ever notice that? And my wife is the world's worst. <laughs> she takes a thousand pictures, and then she puts them on Facebook. And every now and then, people, look, I'll be talking to somebody, says, Pastor Arl, I got a question for you. Well, what was going on up in Homo Sassa? I'm like, what do you mean? You know, we were scalloping. Yeah, but it looks like you were scalloping with jeans on and a, and a shirt. I said, well, yeah, that's true. You were wearing jeans and a shirt with a mask on and flippers? <laughs> that's what it looked like. I said, well, that's what it was. I didn't take any shorts. I, you know, I didn't have a T-shirt. I had a button-up shirt on, almost like a man going to the, to, to the office. But <laughs> I was snorkeling. <laughs> well, and they thought, what are you saying? It's wrong to go swimming with short pants or something? Are you one of those holy guys? You know? I said, no, I believe we have right to bear arms and legs. <laughs> You'll get that. But I did receive a nickname from that experience. I mentioned it Wednesday night about the old show Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges. Some of y'all remember Lloyd Bridges and, and Sea Hunt. I love that show. And so my nickname in Homo Sassa was Lloyd Bridges. Okay. So I know about being on boats and looking at things and envying people sometimes. We have to be very, very careful that we not do that because of what 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says. And this is one of my favorite all time scriptures that I lean on all the time. I have to keep reminding myself of this and that it helps me, it helps me to continue. Verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. As unknown and yet well known. You know, I'm a nobody, and I'm a son of a nobody in this world. I'm just a nobody, and I'm the son of a nobody. Nobody knows my daddy anymore. But yet in the kingdom of God, he called me his son. I am a son of God. Yeah, I'm a nobody, but I am a somebody. Unknown and yet well-known. Poor. Oh, excuse me, as dying, and behold, we live. I've had doctors tell me I'm not supposed to be alive. He told me, you won't be alive at this time in your life. If you can make the first year, you can make five years, you've got a good, about a 40% chance of making it there. 15 years, it goes down. And by the time of 20 years, you have a 20% chance of making it to 20 because what you have is incurable. It is chronic. There's nothing we can do about it. It will come back. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Well, they've missed. Amen? Because God wasn't figured in the equation. And I'm sure if I walked into my old doctor's office today, he would probably look, oh, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> the odds were against you. Dying, and behold, we live. Chasing and not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing as poor and yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Did you get that one? As having nothing, but yet you possess all things. I'm a rich, rich man. In the eyes of the world, no. But in the eyes of eternity, as far as Jesus is concerned, I'm a wealthy man. Amen? Amen. It reminds me of a story I heard from the very first pastor I sat under, Ellie Robertson, Palmetto. Palmetto Church of God, as a matter of fact. And he told this story of an old black man, and he was plowing with a mule. And he worked for this other man, and this man came out to check out how the old black man was doing with that old mule. 
And he noticed that he's always was singing when he'd come out to the field. And he always seemed like he was cheerful. And one day he just couldn't take it anymore. And he, just, he said, I don't understand this. He said, you're always happy when I come out here. It's 100 degrees. Your sweat pouring down your face. But you're either singing or you got a smile. He said, I don't understand it. You don't have hardly anything. He said, look at your old shoes. They've got holes all in them. I mean, I can see part of your foot. But yet you're singing sometimes, and you're, and you're happy. You're rejoicing. How can that be? He said, well, sir, one day these feet will walk on streets of gold. Okay. But look at your clothes. They're threadbare. I can literally see through them in places. I mean, they're just worn out completely. How can you be happy and dress like that? You have nothing. He says, well, one day, I'm going to trade these old clothes for a white robe of righteousness. And the old farmer thought, wow, pretty good. He said, yeah, but that old straw hat you have on, that old straw hat, you can't even hardly tell. The shape is all lost. It's dark from all the sweat on your brow. How can you be happy with that old hat on? He said, I'll tell you. He said, one day. I'm going to trade this old hat for a crown. He said, sir, how about hold this mule? He says, why? He said, because I feel a shout coming on. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so I feel a shout coming on. You ever felt a shout coming on? Amen. When you just become overwhelmed by God's goodness, you might look around and people and say, what are you shouting about? You have nothing to shout about. Oh, I've got Jesus. I have plenty to shout about. Amen. You can shout about your buccaneers all you want to. But I'm going to shout about Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Like I said before, yes, I know I'm a nobody in the world's eyes. But in the kingdom of God, I am a son and a child of God. See, one thing Jesus taught us for sure, it's not all about us. If you notice that, look at Romans chapter 15. Romans 15. It's not all about you. It's not all about me, or at least it shouldn't be. Chapter 15, notice what the Bible says. We then that are strong. You consider yourself a strong Christian? Here's how you can test yourself. You think, I, I think I'm really getting there. I think I'm a good, strong Christian. Well, here's a good test. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Uh-oh. Is it all about you? Or are you more concerned about other people? Or at least concerned about other people? This will just find out how strong you really are. If every time you turn around, you've you got to have what you want. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. Now, that's hard to do sometimes, isn't it? To please your neighbor first. Let us please our neighbor. Why? Because we're trying to make the gospel glorious to the world. They'll see a difference that they may be attracted to Christ. For even Christ, verse 3, pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Your sins fell on Jesus. And he didn't reject them. He took them. And he nailed them to Calvary so that you could be free. Wow, what a deal, church. You see how selfless Jesus really is and how selfless he wants us to be it's not about me my and myself but that's what we're seeing today in our society isn't it? it's all about equality and equal and oh it's got to be fairness and fairness I remember I'd run to my mom and say, mama mom it ain't fair Clifford did this she said shut up and go play <laughs> but it ain't fair he did this or he did that she said boy you're gonna find out life ain't fair did you ever hear that one Life ain't fair. Just deal with it. Now, she, if there was something really bad, she would straighten it up. But you understand what I'm saying? Get out there and fight your differences out. Make, make things better for yourself. But life ain't fair, boy. Don't you think it is? And it's not. Life is not fair. And that's a hard part for us to deal with, isn't it? Amen. But as we look at these things, we've got to realize some of God's heart toward these things. Okay, if he's not selfish, 
he's selfless, then there are certain things that he must care about that maybe I should care about too. Do you know that God cares about the poor? He really does. God cares about the poor. And he always made provision in the Old Testament. When they would glean their fields or, or pick the harvest, they would always leave a section for the poor. God made sure that you always leave a section for the poor. And that's how Ruth and Naomi were able to eat. They were out gleaning the fields because God had made a provision because God cares for the poor. Proverbs 29, 7 says, The righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth not to know it. Sometimes we get all we can, and we can't all we get, and then we sit on the can. And yet there's the needy around us. I know there's also the greedy around us. And there's also those who have brought poverty upon themselves through drug addiction and, and, and alcoholism and all these things. But God said, but the righteous considers those things. You take it into consideration. You ever see somebody on the, on the side of the road, poor and destitute, especially young people? And it aggravates me half the time. I said, man, you, you're plenty healthy enough to get a job. Go get a job. But I forget that they have been stooped in drugs probably for 10 or 15 years, and their brain is just about gone from even being able to think. And, and I think that child, that was a, someone's child one time. That was a little baby that somebody held and sang to it, maybe the mama. And now here they are, their life destroyed. Sometimes that's hard to just look away from, isn't it? It is. And it's hard to discern because sometimes we have to. I've been ripped off so much at this church, it ain't funny. Or I used to be. I've tried to get a little wiser about it. Because believe me, people mark churches. Believe me, they will mark churches. I remember one time a guy came here with wanting money. And I about had it. <laughs> I had a bunch of them that week. And it was always the same story. I think they told each other the same story and then got here and told it again. And I'm like, this is just getting ridiculous. And finally, this guy comes up, same old thing. I said, look, buddy, I don't have a dime. I'm broke. I've done give it all away. He looked at me like, yeah, right, preacher. You know, I see the doubt in his mind. I said, oh, you think I'm lying, huh? I said, let me show you. And I was a little agitated. I got my wallet out. Let me show you. But he said, no, no, okay, I believe you. No, no, preacher, it's okay. I said, no, man, by this time I was, I was determined. Boy, I opened that thing up, and there were five $20 bills. <laughs> I didn't know Penny had put some money in my wallet. <laughs> she usually takes it out. <laughs> but, man, I'm like, oh, and he's looked at me like, what kind of weirdo have I come up on? So I gave it to him. A young couple came up. Boy, they gave me the saddest story, and I fell for it. I, I swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, gave him some money. And as a young girl, I mean, she was a young girl, was going out the door, she hollered back, sucker, got in the car and took off. I thought, man, these people. So I know it's difficult sometimes to discern, but we have to have a heart for those who truly, truly are and that's why I think he says, consider. We need to consider what happened. Why it might. And we can even ask. And usually when someone says, I'm hungry, I say, well, I'll go get you some food. I don't want that. I want cash. I know what that means. It means a drug addiction. Nine times out of ten. But we must, must consider people that are less fortunate. than. Our. And there's so many ways to be poor. It's not all financial. And it's not all just about food. There's so many different needs that people have, and I've been struggling with it lately, trying to find out well, what can we do as a church to, to really make a difference in society? I mean, to make a, a real difference for people that are in the need, because too many times we just throw money down a hole, down a rabbit hole, and I'm not interested in that. I've done that myself. You've done that many times. So you try to make sure you find something that's reliable, something trustworthy, some cause that you can actually live. I've seen poverty. I've been to Haiti. I know what poor is. I mean, I'm not bragging, but I'm just saying, wow, seen it firsthand. 
and your heart goes out and you just want to pour money at it. But that's not always the answer. It's never the answer, really, to just pour money at it. If you don't believe me, just go to Haiti. They've been pouring money down there for, for a century just about. And it's still poverty almost everywhere you go. There's the filthy rich and there's the filthy poor. There is no middle class in Haiti. But yet I've met Haitians who had nothing and possess it all because they know Jesus. I've talked with them. Same situation. They're laughing. They're smiling. They're joyous. How can you be happy living like this? You have nothing. Oh, no, you're wrong. I have something. I mean, there's sometimes they put us to shame. We were getting ready for a concert one time down in Haiti. It was going to be at that night. About 4 o'clock in the morning, we hear something outside of our windows. What's going on? What's all this noise? Said, Those people are praying for y'all. 4 o'clock in the morning, they started, and the concert wasn't until 8 o'clock that night, or the revival, I should say. But they'd ask us to come down and do the worship part. I thought, man, I've never heard of that in America. I've never heard of people getting out at 4 o'clock in the morning and on their face praying all day for that revival. So, yeah, just because people are poor outwardly doesn't mean they're poor inwardly. And I'll be honest with you. I begin to look around America, and it looks like a third world country in some places. It really is. And that concerns me. Something's wrong. And once again, you can throw $10 trillion at that. And it's not going to fix it because that's not the root. That's not the root of the problem. And I've been trying to, to become a little wiser in my older age and my decisions in the church. Some of you may remember the mission rangers here at the church. Remember when the Boy Scouts were mixing with the girls and they were talking about transgenders bathing with the boys and girls together? And, and that, that bothered me because it told me where society is. So people don't know if they're, what, what sex they are. They don't know if they're a boy or a girl. I tell you what, you get in front of a five-year-old, drop your pants, and he'll tell you. <laughs> it ain't that hard. A five-year-old can tell you. But we've got so crazy in this country. And it, it really bothered me, and I, I felt like I'm tired of just talking about it. I'm tired, I'm tired of just, you know, preaching about it. Let's do something about it. And if you remember, we started the Mission Rangers. I said, anybody want to help out, just come on over. We're going to get this thing going. And we did. And we really hit it, gangbusters. I mean, full bore. And next thing you know, the girls wanted to have their own thing. And they started the thing. And it was camping and fishing and boating. And we did all sorts of archery. I mean, everything the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts would have done, things like that, to get these kids off of their computers, out into the nature, to see God's creation, and to try to instill God in them. We even called it Troop 33, which was based off of Matthew 3 and 3. Make his path straight. Straighten these paths out for these young people. It's so crooked, they don't know where to go. And felt this tremendous call to do that. And did do that. But with volunteers, after a while, it starts losing its steam. And I begin to understand why organizations have full-time employees and volunteers because volunteers come and they go and, they, and it's always going to be that way but you got to have a core that stays there that's firm and usually that's a paid staff but of course we can't never do that we could not have a paid staff or mission rangers but there's other organizations that do have those sort of things that are operating right now and they have the facilities to do these things and I'm learning the thing to do is to team up with them. I've always wanted to have a youth camp. So if we could save enough money and, and buy a piece of land on a river and, and build a youth camp, wouldn't that be awesome? Well, that's not going to happen. Well, Brother Arlen, you don't believe God can do that? Yes, I believe God can do that, but that's not what God called me to. But he has called some people to it, and he's already done it. They have the facilities. So I'm beginning to believe it's easier to team up with people who know what they're doing, got everything in place, and then you just join up with them. It's if they're people of integrity. 
And that's what you have to search out. That's what you have to vet out and make sure. We went all the way to Haiti to make sure what we were doing here at this church for the Haitians is right. We went to the schools. We talked with the teachers. We saw the preacher that started that school. They were teaching these kids how to read and to write so they could read the Bible. That was the main thing because 80% illiteracy in Haiti. You can give them Bibles, but they can't read it. So we started supporting schools, Christian schools in Haiti, so that those children would learn how to read and write and could read a Bible. So now that when we send Bibles down there, we know that it's going to a good cause. So these things have to be vetted. And we've been trying to do that for a while. Now, most of you have heard of a, an organization called Samaritan's Purse. Matter of fact, we have supported it for several years now with the shoe boxes. Every Christmas, y'all get together these shoe boxes and put all these toys and things in it and send them overseas to different countries. These kids will have something for Christmas. So we've been organizing with these people for quite some time now, or at least participating in something they've already organized, and we just join in with them. And it's so much easier, especially when you know they're doing the right thing and the good thing. And we've been given kind of a challenge. We've been given a pretty sizable donation. But we want to challenge ourselves to add to that donation and double it for some kind of a ministry. And this is my heart, okay? And I've never tried to put my heart onto your heart. So if anybody has a problem with it, let me know afterwards. Because my heart is in it because of me. Your heart may not be in what I'm talking about. Okay? But we want to be in the same heart, the same mind. Know that God is working. And what's been on my heart is this. In this church, let's see what time it is. Okay, we got time. <laughs> you may or not notice it, but every year we, we try to remember our fallen soldiers for Memorial Day. And for Veterans Day, those who have served and are still alive, that's always been a big part of this church. And the reason is because my brother came back from Vietnam back in the 70s, 1971. And our nightmare for our family ended. It was a nightmare having him in Vietnam for 13 months. Literal. I remember my little sister crying her heart out in the middle of the night sometimes. And I'm thinking, Clifford's been killed. Why would she wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning calling out his name and crying? I, I think God's trying to tell us he's gone. And I would sit there with just tears rolling down my face. And I'd get mad at him. Why did you do this to us? Mom and Daddy are a mess. I've seen them cry for the first time in my life. They're, they're weeping their heart out over you. It was a nightmare, but he came home. Our nightmare ended. We got our brother back, and we lived happily ever after. But then I got saved. Then I began seeing soldiers that didn't come home, families. And I thought, man, I was so selfish. I didn't care. As long as we got our brother back, that's all that mattered. He came back, but many of them didn't. From wars. There's so many who didn't come back, and for those families, their nightmare didn't end. And their anguish didn't end. And so I developed a, a really tremendous heart for soldiers. And I've come to realize in the last 50 years, my brother did come home. But I can look back now and say, he was different. He wasn't the boy that left. As I look back now, we didn't know anything about PTSD. Never even heard the word. But I have talked with my brother in the past, recently. And for many years he felt guilty. Why did I come back? Why did I live? So many of his friends didn't. And he carried that guilt for years. Why? Why? did I live and they didn't and he shared that with me the shame when he got off the plane in America thinking people were going to at least thank him they spit on him and cursed him 
as he got off the airplane coming back to America. You don't think that would bother you? You child killer. You murderer. You're thinking you're going to come back to a hero's welcome and just the opposite. And you're already feeling guilty about things that have happened to you. That's right, brother. I found out all that stuff. I've seen it on the news, but I didn't realize the pain that brought to the soldiers. I didn't really realize that until I found out he's had nightmares for many years. And his wife, what she's been going through for all these years, not being able to help him in those nightmares, reliving those scenes over and over. So for me, it's a, it's a special thing. And I know maybe that's not for you because you didn't experience what I'm beginning to experience. Maybe it's, you haven't been touched by it. But it touched me. And as I was checking into this organization, Samaritan's Purse, I learned that there are over 100,000 men and women just from Iraq and Afghanistan who have been injured. Some of them not physically. Many of them with no arms and legs. You've seen them. Horrible, horrible injuries. But some look at their body, they seem fine, but they're not. Their souls have been crushed emotionally, moral, moral, mor morally, and spiritually. And so this organization, as I was checking into it, they began a ministry. It's called Operation Heal Our Patriots. Operation Heal Our Patriots. And if anybody needs healing today, it's our patriots, our soldiers. They have been so maligned. It, well, I better not get into this. I get angry when I see someone kneeling at the flag. And I see on the commercial a guy with no arms and no legs. It, it bothers me. So I've asked the Lord for my own self, Lord, this is my heart. You see, they already have a place. They don't have to start something. They haven't called me and said, Pastor Bear, we're going to start something. Could you all get together and help us get this off the ground? They already have the facilities and everything. And it's in Alaska. And they take these families to Alaska in the summertime. <laughs> That's the downside. It has to be between June and in September, there is a short window because of the, the bitter cold in Alaska. But one thing that happens is they get along with God. No cell phones, no nothing. And I hope we've got a video queued up. Is it going to work, Bill? We're going to find out. Because they can explain it a whole lot better than I can. Okay? So this is hopefully an excerpt from Heal Our Patriots, Samaritan's Purse. No sound. Well, evidently it's not going to work, but we'll have it fixed for next week. I threw it on them at the last minute, so it's my fault. Go ahead and hit those lights, please. But I promise you by next week we'll have something worked out. You'll be able to, to see it because they can explain it a whole lot better than me. And it's something I want you to be praying about, see how you feel about it, because maybe you said, brother, that has nothing to do with me. I, I'm just not into that. And I want to know that. Amen? We want to be gathered as a church, making a difference in this world. And I have read a lot about Samaritan's Purse. And of course, there's always those who try to sling mud, and there always will be. But everything I've found, they are legitimate legitimate and they're doing a, not just this, they're doing so many things amen and we've already teamed up with them and my consideration is to team up 
some more with them in a lot bigger fashion. Amen? And God has blessed us, church. Amen? And we want to do something very positive that will help. And there's testimonies of how God has healed their marriages. You can imagine the good that God has done. Because I could never ask you for enough money to buy a place in Alaska and build the facility and take people over there. But they start taking the applications February 22. And I know there's possibly people in our congregation that we maybe could fill that application for them and they would get to go through this program also. Amen. And heal some soldiers that's been in our midst because I know we have some and have had some. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you really have blessed us so much. It's so easy sometimes to get all we can and can all we get and sit on the can. This is for my retirement. This is for my future. This is for this and that. And, and we do have to plan for the future. But there always has to be a place in our heart to realize that those who are less fortunate than we are, and when we see an opportunity present itself to make a real difference in people's lives, Father, I just pray for this, this possibility that you would touch hearts. People would get on board if this is you. And that this money would go to heal so many wounded soldiers and their wives. That when they come back, they're different men or they're different women from when they left. So I just pray, God, touch our hearts, deal with our hearts through the week. And next Sunday, we'll present this presentation and uh, let it speak for itself. Brother Franklin Graham is, is the son of Billy Graham. <laughs> We've all been touched by both those ministries. So we just ask now, go with us as we leave here today. Keep us safe is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Some of you have asked for prayer, so you can come forward at this time. We're going to pray. The rest of you can consider yourself dismissed. Thank you for being here today. Try to stay safe. We know there's this new COVID thing going on. So God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>